All right, we're going to continue with our series entitled Sex and Male-Female Relations. And we'll continue as we did before. I'll have Joan read out loud a list of points I've given to her, mm -hmm. after which I'll comment on them. Read them as you did before, Joan, one at a time, please. Increase your capacity to bear the blunt facts about love and marriage. Increase your capacity to bear the blunt facts about love and marriage. You increase your capacity to understand the blunt facts about love and marriage. You increase your capacity by dropping all your acquired ideas about marriage, about love, about romance, about moonlight and roses. Dropping all your daydreams about it dropping all your dependencies toward that man or toward that woman, by not trying to make a romantic movie out of your life, by seeing that you have to depend upon yourself first of all and not count on that man or woman to do it for you, but that'll come in a, a later point. Increase your capacity to simply understand what it is all about which is done very easily and comes to you very effortlessly when you truly understand what you are all about. And you are not all about being that great lover or that great loveress or that woman who's been loved so long by her husband or by the wife. If you live in dreamland about love and marriage, you will have a good deal of fear in connection with it. And you will have a lot of resentment in connection with it. Can you see that? Can you see how you're living in tension towards someone you're supposed to love or someone who loves you? Can you see the tension in your relationship? Can you see that maybe he won't want you tomorrow? Can you see that he might betray you tomorrow? He might find another woman tomorrow? She might find another man tomorrow. What is that to you? You had better stop demanding loyalty of that man, that woman. Sure, you can keep anyone loyal if you want to threaten them overtly or quietly. You can keep anyone in chains. You know how to do it. You've done it before. We've all done it. So you have someone who is loyal to you mechanically because they fear you. And this is what you call love and marriage. Wouldn't it be nice to be related to a man or to a woman so free of yourself that if he or she wants to behave badly, that be bad behavior can't touch you. He or she wants to walk out and leave town, that departure can't touch you. I asked you before, which do you want? That woman, that man, or truth itself? If you choose that man or that woman, you're going to be jittery, you're going to be shaky, and you're going to hate him or her half the time. And you're not really hating him or her after all, but your own self-imposed slavery to him and her because you want certain benefits from the situation. You want protection against this hostile world by keeping that man or that woman. You're still scared. Now you're just two people huddling together instead of one person. Why don't you be scared all alone and see what happens? Every time you have an ally in fear, you increase your fear and your own deviltry and your own arrogance. And if you add three people, you're more arrogant than before and four and five until you become an insane mob. Read the next one, John. 
Let me pile all my troubles on you and let's call it love. <laughs> let me pile all my troubles on you and let's call it love. I want all of you from this day forward to watch carefully in your relations with that man or with that woman that you may have in your life now or you will, will have tomorrow. I want you to watch very, very carefully how it's merely an exchange of burdens. Now this is blunt stuff and you had better be able to take it. You watch very carefully how that woman, sir, that woman wants to blab to you all day and all night in exchange for what she's given you. Watch how everyone is trying to unburden themselves on the other person. Please make my decisions for me. Please think for me. Should I do this or should I do that? What do you think is best? What do you think is right? Should I write the letter or make the phone call or shouldn't I? And this masquerades under a nice, nice sharing marriage. Watch what happens when the other person refuses to bear and share your burden anymore. For one thing, you might, you just might, if you have any self-observation at all, you might get ashamed of yourself. And then you know what you do when you get ashamed of yourself? You'll hate the other person. You'll blame him and you'll want to get away from him or her because every time you look at him or her, he reminds you of your shame, which is what little cowards we are. And I'll quickly add another point. If you ever have a bad relationship with someone and they're still in your life in some way, you be very courageous and go up and make it right regardless of what it costs you. You be right. You be right in relationship to that person regardless of what it costs you. I don't say you, you fawn before them. You be right, regardless of what the other person does. Read that one again, please. Let me pile all my troubles on you and let's call it love. All right, before we leave that point, you also watch carefully how you behave toward that man or that woman in your life how you are piling all your troubles in one way or another onto him or her. And if you have an ounce of sense, you will use the situation rightly to grow inwardly instead of being so lazy that you want that man or that woman to think for you as if he or she can anyway. Why don't you start making small decisions for yourself? You catch yourself about to ask your wife or husband should I write that letter? You catch yourself before you say that and you make up your own mind to either write it or don't write it. And you've taken a step toward God, believe it or not, because you're beginning to think for yourself in a very, very, very small way. And sometime, ladies, when you're not quite sure whether your husband will like that dinner you're fixing, do you prefer corn or peas? set down the corn and say, we're having corn tonight. And if he grouches, watch him grouch and watch how he can intimidate you and refuse it. Don't you dare sell your soul to that person in order to feel comfort that you have pleased him. That doesn't mean you don't please people. Of course you do. You're a nice person. You act pleasantly. I'm talking about this fear of displeasing them, which is the life of practically everyone on the face of the earth. Fear of displeasing another human being. And so you play it safe. You play it safe and never learn. You watch how characteristic it is of right inner progress to begin to displease people you pleased before. You watch. As a matter of fact, 
you'll displease some of them so badly, they'll go. They'll leave you. And that'll be a happy day in your life that you've been true to yourself instead of selling yourself. Go ahead, Joan, please. Where I feel threatened by sex is where I must work. Where I feel threatened by sex is where I must work. <clears throat> that simply means where you have a sex problem any way at all. The way you think toward it, maybe you're jealous of someone who has more sex or better sex than you think you have, or you're ashamed, any way at all, any way. You, you think sex thoughts and then you condemn yourself for thinking bad thoughts. You think God is seeing you and condemning you and all that. Simply try to understand what is going on. Simply see that certain mechanical movements connected with sex are going through your whole psychic system. You didn't originate those. You were you acquired them somewhere, but you didn't originate them any more than you originate any thoughts. You don't originate anything. You don't originate anything. You simply pick them up somewhere and continue to carry them when you could drop them. Read it once more, please. Where I feel threatened by sex is where I must work. We've said before that it's quite possible to look at a sex problem scientifically instead of getting emotional about it, instead of being ashamed of it. Simply understand what is going on. Just, just as if something went wrong with your automobile. You'd lift up the hood and take a pair of pliers or something and find out what went wrong. You don't condemn the spark plug. Don't condemn yourself and don't feel ashamed. How many of you feel ashamed about sex in some way? Huh? How about how about past sex experiences? Still ashamed of that? Remember that dreadful way you treated that woman, you men? Remember that shameless way you treated that woman? You ladies, remember that shameless way you treated that man connected with sex in some way? All that has to go. That kind of shame should be observed and then dropped. Otherwise, you're recreating time and recreating your problem and recreating the opportunity, the possibility of doing the same thing again because you haven't changed. Your nature hasn't changed. Anything you're ashamed of, you're tied to, and therefore you will do it again if the opportunity comes up. You watch. You watch. And you will have the tendency toward it, and the only thing that may prevent you is lack of opportunity. Read the next one, please. Conflict with the opposite sex will end when your neurosis ends. Conflict with the opposite sex will end when your neurosis ends. I don't think a good deal of discussion need be given to that point. It's pretty evident, is it not? We're mixed up in many, many ways, financially, mentally, wrong thoughts toward health, for example, and sexually. We can begin to study any wrong part of us, study it, make it healthy, and the health of that corrected part will then spread to another unhealthy part, touch it, and begin to make it healthy too. The light that spreads from one room to the next to the next makes the first room light. It'll open the door and it'll spread to the next room, make it light. So we can start anywhere we want. Tonight we're talking about sex. We can begin to straighten that out. It will straighten out a thousand other problems. Compulsive desires toward a man or woman blocks your intelligence and invites problems. Compulsive desire toward a man or woman blocks your intelligence and invites problems. Don't you give yourself away. Don't you give your life away to any man or any woman because he or she excites you. He or she is attractive sexually, physically, charming. 
you walk into it, you walk into it with your eyes closed, you're going to get bumped sooner or later. You're going to get trapped sooner or later. And the trap will spring on you sooner or later. One of the beauties of these teachings here is that pre they prevent us from getting into trouble in the first place. Because we can foresee the future in a very clear way because we understand the past in a clear way. We understand because we've taken responsibility for what happened to us in the past. We see that weak, compulsive person got into trouble five years ago with that marriage or with that romance, got into trouble because we were indeed compulsive and very stupid. We just thought it was the most wonderful thing that could have happened to have met that other person. And so we set up all these little images and dreams of how it was going to be forevermore. And gradually, 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 the heaviness begins. Right? right. Read it once more, please. Compulsive desire toward a man or woman blocks your intelligence and invites problems. Block intelligence. Have any of you ever done anything in a, not just in connection with a man or a woman, in a, the heat of passion, anything at all, and later regretted it? Anything. Yes. Yeah. All right, now connect this with this man-woman situation. Oh, have any of you ever been impulsively involved with another person and wish you'd stayed home that night? <laughs> Read the next one, please. Listen to the voice of truth, not to the voice of emotional self-interest, yours or the others. Listen to the voice of truth, not to the voice of emotional self-interest, yours or the others. That connects pretty much with what we've talked to up till now, so read the next one, please. You should love your male-female problems because they reveal you have problems. You should love your male-female problems because they reveal you have problems. Do you understand that statement? Do you, all right? When you have a problem with a man, with a woman, romantic, sex problem, whatever it might be, if you will look at yourself when you have this problem, you will find that you dislike it. You will find that you want the problem to go away. You will find that there's a part in you that dislikes it. And you shove it away. How do you shove it away? You blame the man. You blame the woman. You go into tears. You go into accusation. You go into revenge. You go into a a hermitage, a mental hermitage. Pushing the problem away, hating the problem, instead of loving it. I give you an order that from now on, for the rest of your life, you will love every single problem that comes your way. You will love it. You will welcome it. You will look at it so as to put an end to it. You can't get rid of a problem that you hate Every time you hate the problem, you keep it going. You will love the problem in a very, very special way. Because in back of the loving of the problem is the love of understanding. The love of wishing to find out what happened. Where was I asleep that caused this particular thing to happen? Where was I enchanted by that woman? Where was I overcome by that man? So I didn't really care what happened to me. As long as I could keep the hypnosis, hypnosis of his or her charm going for a few hours, a few days, a few weeks. If you begin to really love that problem you have with that man or that woman, you'll begin to comprehend it. And the instant you comprehend it, it ends. Right now. There is no more problem because you are not a problem. And look, 
do you, do you begin to get a small glimpse even that the problem is never that other person? Never, never, never. It's impossible for the problem to be the other person. The problem is my wrong relationship with him or her. I'm the problem. I solve me, I solve the problem, and I start by loving it. I want to find out what you're all about. I'm going to investigate. If I have to find out that I'm the biggest idiot on earth, I'll find that out if necessary. If I have to become uh, dismayed at my weakness, at how foolish I am, I'll go through that if necessary in order to solve me, in order to solve the problem, in order to not recreate it again. I don't care what happens to me. I want to find out what happens to me. Then bad things will no longer happen to me. My mind won't tear me apart all day long as it used to do. If I'm a problem to me, I'm a problem to you. I'm a problem to everyone I meet if I'm a problem to me. If I'm no problem to me, I'm no problem to anyone I meet. I'm therefore able to help anyone I meet. And I help them on a very elementary basis by staying away from them. Read one more, Joan, then we'll take a break. Dear love, I want you to make my decisions for me, but if you make wrong ones, I have a right to hate you. <laughs> Dear love, I want you to make my decisions for me, but if you make wrong ones, I have a right to hate you. Do you understand the broad implications of that? When you demand anything of someone, the very fact that you demand, for example, that they make the decisions means you're on a very low level of being. Now that very low level of being will blame the minute something goes wrong. Have you ever helped someone and they blamed you when it went wrong? Have you ever been that dumb? Are you still that dumb? People ask for your help, then when it goes wrong they sue you? Don't you feel sorry for people who demand your help, who plead for your help? You take a look at that person very carefully. Now you, you understand. I hope you understand. I'm not saying turn down people who need help in the right way. But you'd better be intelligent to know the whole story of why that person got into this position in the first place, for example. I'm saying try to be very intelligent toward people who ask for your assistance and for your help. I'll tell you, and you know it, you're going to nod your heads internally when I say what I'm going to say next. They'll turn on you. They'll turn on you. They'll demand more. You give them a loaf of bread today and they'll want two tomorrow. You had better wake up. You had better wake up to the point where what you have to give people, what you have to give people cannot be a danger to you because it's not on the level of cause and effect. If you give people dangerous things such as your advice, your money, your time, your marriage or whatever, if you give people things on the level of time, you can get hurt. If you give them truth, if you give them truth, you can't get hurt. and you'll know who to give truth to and where to keep your mouth shut. Which means you'll keep your mouth shut most of your life. <laughs> Read it once more, please. Dear love, I want you to make my decisions for me, but if you make wrong ones, I have a right to hate you. I'm going to tell you what to do the rest of your life. <laughs> How's that for a broad help, huh? <laughs> When people ask for your assistance, 
you remember everything you've learned in this class. Repeat. When people ask for your assistance, you remember everything you've learned in this class and act accordingly. Write down a sentence, please. I need not say yes or no. I need not say yes or no, but need to understand which eliminates yes and no. I need not say yes or no, but need to understand which eliminates yes and no. Is that clear to you, Dorothy? No. I need not say yes or no, but need to understand which eliminates yes and no. All right, you think about it a little bit, and you watch your day and night, and see how it is always going yes or no, yes, no, yes, no, and until it drives you nuts. If you understand, you will eliminate yes and no, except on its proper level. Yes, I'll have butter instead of jam. Yes, I'll have butter instead of jam. That's fine. But there be no yes and no concerning your past or your future or your now. Because there's no yes or no in now. There's only now. And that now is understanding, is comprehension, and is effortless. Clear now? Now you're going to live by that from now on, correct? Yes. Correct? Yes. Write down another sentence now that you've mastered that one. <laughs> I need not make a problem out of a problem. I need not make a problem out of a problem. Do you know why you have a problem? Because you're who you are. <laughs> you have a problem because you think incorrectly. And then incorrect thinking is trying to correct that problem. What do you think happens? Now you've got two, right? Mm -hmm. If you could think correctly toward your problem, you wouldn't have it. If you could see the problem above yes and no, you wouldn't have the problem. There would be no one there to have a problem. Because when there's understanding, there's no you. Joan is following precisely. <laughs> Are you not? No. I am my problem, you are, the, you are your problem. Cease to be you, and you have no problems. And don't say, I'll then have the problem of wondering who I am. <laughs> you wonder who you am on the level of thinking, when you want to be somebody, no matter who or what it is. And sometimes it's very nice, you find it very convenient to find someone who has problems, because then you can go ask someone else for help. You are the, the man, the woman with a problem, the marriage problem, for example. Now you can cry out for help. I dare you, I challenge you, effective right now, to no longer make a problem out of your problem. Watch it disappear and watch you disappear, which is what you fear above all else in life. Your greatest single fear in life is the disappearance of what you call yourself. And you only dimly understand what that means as yet. But you're getting on to it because we've approached it from every part of the circle and will continue to do so until you see. Until you see that you are composed of nothing but your memorized thoughts. You are a memorized person. And if you drop the memory of who you are, you will no longer be that, and you will therefore no longer have a problems connected with who you imagine you are. You will be free of every problem on earth, which just terrifies the life out of you, doesn't it? You can drop your problems right now if you want. You don't want to, huh? You'd rather cry, ladies. You'd rather get mad, men. 
You'd rather go around with some of the faces I see in this room? Enjoying your drama? And hoping to get applause from it? From other people? Get off the stage. Then you'll have no fear of non-applause from the audience. You're afraid of non-applause from the audience precisely because you are on stage in imagination, in self-dramatics, in your demands. All right, we have lots of time for open discussion. What would you like to talk about? Any questions about anything we talked about earlier? in a marriage and in the light of this truth that we're learning is there such a thing as a couple sharing a couple sharing yeah. yes people can share on two different levels this is very very easy to see a couple can share on two different levels practically all married couples share on the everyday level and on its own level it's not wrong to share companionship we're social beings that's right you go on a vacation with your wife or husband that's fine that's nice or you go for a walk with your boyfriend or girlfriend that's nice too no problem there we're exchanging with each other right trouble is if you share on that level alone you're both scared human beings and you will try to unload on each other very subtly so as not to appear to be doing so because you think you're nice and you're not and you think he or she is nice and he and she is not I'll tell you a, a very beautiful thing is a man and a woman who wants truth more than they want to trade everyday benefits with each other. A man and a woman who have come to the point of defeat in their lives, which is quite necessary, defeated, no longer wanting to conquer the world. Let's get together and maybe we could start this little business together, huh? Let's get married and we'll start a little business and we'll build it up over the years. trouble with us here we're not defeated enough we won't permit ourselves to be defeated we still want to fight but a man and a woman who really can talk about these things you go home or you go for a ride or whatever you go to the cafe and instead of indulging in stupid gossip about the election or about how good or bad the food is you work right in that cafe you become conscious of passing the salt shaker to each other you watch your reactions when the food is set in front of you. You're watching each other and you're watching yourself, all trying to understand what it, life is all about. This is great. That's, that's sharing way up here on this level. And I'll tell you, it isn't easy at all to find someone who'll do this. Ladies, your boyfriends are, are, want to go to the football game, right? Men, your ladies want to gossip. Or what do you ladies want to do? No problem. Let's not make a problem out of it. If no other human being on earth wanted to find himself, you could do it, and you could do it all alone with help. <laughs> yes, Connie. Why are we so possessive? You tell me why. Are you possessive, Connie? Yes. Why? What are you afraid of? Well, it has to be fear of losing the other person. Of course it is.
See, look. Our neurosis, our daily routines are familiar. Are they not? We're in love with the familiar. And if that person departs, I won't know what to do with myself. I knew what to do with myself if I woke up in the morning. I could grouch at my husband. But he's not there. What will I do with myself this morning? This is the way it is. We're so used to following a routine with that other person that we feel empty and lost without it. If I just had him to fight with again. And the reason I don't say love again because you didn't love each other anyway. And you know it. It's the unfamiliar, the unknown that makes us possessive. We want our minds filled up today with what happened yesterday and hope that it'll continue until tomorrow. Because now all my fears are pushed back, see. I've got all this distraction of being with this lady, this lady or whatever. But if he or she goes, there I am, sitting all alone. What'll I do? Why don't you sit there and cry all night long? When, you're, when your man leaves you, ladies, you sit there and cry all night long while watching yourself cry. You watch yourself cry all night long. The next day you watch yourself suppressing your tears in front of those people because they don't care anyway while you cry. They don't even know you. And you cry again the next night until you get to the point where all your arrogance is knocked out of you and you see what a scared, scared, scared woman you have always been, thinking that that man was your strength. That man was an idiot. He had no strength at all. He was able to con you because you were so desperate to have someone around. And on the other side of your tears is freedom so that you'll never, never, never cry again under any conditions. different places that sex is a neutralizing force and I don't understand that. Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> so, shall we go on to the next question? <laughs> what that really means, uh, there's man, uh, woman, female, two come together and that's the third force, the neutralizing force. Opposites, male, female, come together. Order. Uh, you mentioned about evil, and I saw clearly how evil needs company to uh, make itself appear right. The more evil a person is, the more allies he will need. Yes. Your degree of mental health can be determined by the number of people you can do without. In fact, evil cannot stand alone. Evil can never stand alone. I keep saying that because <laughs> I'll repeat it. <laughs> you ever, look, as a simple example on that point, the cowardice of crowds, mm -hmm. every crowd, every crowd is a bunch of cowards. And this is not an original thought with me, but whoever put it this way put it very well. Bad, sick, uh, evil behavior that a person would never dare do all alone, he would do in a crowd because yeah. he has allies. Yeah. Well, he's doing it. I guess it's all right. Besides, I'm hidden. There's ten of us. Maybe no one else will notice me. If you want to wake up, don't you dare be part of the crowd in any way at all. Don't even think like the crowd. One purpose of this work is to get people out of your life, not to get them into your life. And as you change, you'll find no pleasure in their company 
anymore. And you wonder and you wonder how you could have been so dumb all along as to go out with that man or that woman. Wonder what on earth was the matter with my brain? Well, it was because you were on the same level as that person you wanted to go out with. Yes. Well, we can explore that uh, concept further, that one's mental health is proportionate to the number of people he can do without. If you carry that to the ultimate, then uh, uh, the ideal uh, state of mental health is uh, needing no one. It depends on what level you're talking about. We all need each other socially to exchange my bread for your potatoes, things like that. We need people on that level. Look, do you understand that above that all you need is one thing and you tell me what that is? What is the one thing you need? Truth itself with a capital T. Then when you have that, you will relate rightly socially. So where's the problem? We're not talking about being antisocial here. Matter of fact, you're antisocial when you're asleep all the time smiling and putting out your big friendly hand. You're antisocial. You'll wonder what you can get from that man, from that woman. If it's nothing more than they like you. If somebody likes me. He smiled at me. The more you go with crowds, the more lonely you will feel because this means you're isolated from yourself. You're apart. You're alienated from who you really are and you're trying to cover it up with the ballroom dancing, with the <coughs> political crowd, with the horse racing crowd. As you begin to find yourself, you find yourself not attracted to this. I'm not talking about the entertainment part. Entertainment is quite logical, necessary, as an opposite to, say, hard work. Nature gives us those right opposites. I'm talking about being attracted to a place where there are a lot of people simply because you can't stand your own company. The day will come when you find your own company very, very pleasant, and you won't think about it at all. You won't even think how pleasant. If you think how pleasant, you're still an egotist. You don't have to think about it at all. You're free of yourself, you see? Is the converse true? Excuse me, please. Would you raise your hand? Everybody raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you, then we keep order. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, is the converse true then? As one becomes more comfortable with himself, he becomes more uncomfortable with crowds. Uh, no, you don't become uncomfortable with crowds because you're still, you're not a prey of, of discomfort. You simply don't want to be around them. I broke that down finally. I understood what you meant, yes. You know, w when you're free, eminently, you can go anywhere. How, how can anything touch you? You can walk through the brawling bar room untouched. Daniel in the bar room den. <laughs> Continue with our discussion of sex and male-female relations. Go ahead, Joan, please. Your dinner companion who gives trouble to the waitress is just dying to give trouble to you. Your dinner companion who gives trouble to the waitress is just dying to give trouble to you. Is that evident in itself or should I comment on it? Is it clear? Clear? Neurosis must have a target. And when the waitress is gone, the neurotic man, the neurotic woman will turn to the next nearest target, which may be you. And you'll never escape. It has to go somewhere. All this pressure and nervousness and hatred, defensiveness and offensiveness has to strike out somewhere. Sooner or later, I've told you before, and to make a short comment on that, you watch very carefully when you meet a member of the opposite sex for the first time. You watch very, very carefully 
that he or she will, of course, be on his or her best behavior at the start, pleasant, smiling, and nice little conversations. And you watch very carefully for the first faint slipping of the mask, the mask of goodness, of decency, of being a pleasant person. In some cases, it won't take very long. And in other cases, it will take a little longer because the other person is a pretty good and trained actor or actress. But no actor is that good, believe me. And if you're a very observant person in the audience watching the act, you'll be able to see it in small ways. And that's a warning sign for you to beware. or you'll end up in trouble as you have in the past. And if you get too deeply involved, you'll then have the problem on the everyday level of getting out of it. Because what you have reaped on that level, you will sow. Or sow what you've sowed, you've reaped. That's the better order. <laughs> what you've sowed, you will have to reap on that level. Then when you become conscious, you will no longer sow on that level and therefore you'll no longer have to reap. Only being wide awake, being conscious, being aware can prevent you from sowing where you'll eventually have to reap weeds. And you'll sow nice wheat seeds or corn seeds and reap good things. Read the next one, please. No matter how long you have believed it, Regardless of how hard you now believe it, it is not you against the world of men. No matter how long you have believed it, regardless of how hard you now believe it, it is not you against the world of men. Did you ladies hear that? Do you ladies really think you have to play little subtle games against men? because they are in charge of this world, or you think they are? You understand that could be reversed, don't you? But I simply put it that way. You think you have to hold your own against men? Why do you think that at all? Why don't you be above men? Why don't you transcend their maleness, which you will do when you transcend your femaleness and be, may, be female only on the proper level? You can be female and have a competitive spirit with men and feel tense toward them, or you can be female and be free of men and be female toward men properly, naturally, without any problems involved at all. It's very simple, but I wonder whether you overlook the simplicity of it. You're not in competition with any man or any woman on earth. You are really not. You think you're in competition because you're living in time instead of in eternity. When you're no longer living in time, in thought, you're living in eternity, and in eternity, there's no competition at all. And by the way, the absence of thought is eternity. And you can live in eternity right now if you want at five minutes after nine on this Saturday morning. You can be eternal right now if you like. Or do you prefer fighting men, getting things from men? Or do you prefer fighting women and getting things from women? You can have time or you can have eternity, but you can't have both. Make up your mind what you want. Do you understand the profundity of what you've been given already think about it for the rest of your life choose eternity and watch how time falls effortlessly into place so that time is a part of your life on the physical level but there's no problems connected with it Go ahead, John. When you finally love truth more than you love the other person, 
You truly love that person for the first time. When you finally love truth more than you love the other person, you truly love that person for the first time. And everyone else in the world. If you don't love everyone in the world, you don't love that man, truly. If you don't love every other human being on earth, you don't love that man or that woman. Love can't be specialized. On the everyday level, you can have that one man or one woman, but you have to love everyone as much as you love your wife or your husband or you don't love him or her at all. Read it once more, please. When you finally love truth more than you love the other person, you truly love that person for the first time. I've urged you before, and I'll urge you again, in your relations with men, women, Try sometime putting what you know, feel, sense is right ahead of pleasing them in order to hold them, in order to make them pleased with you. Try sometime putting God, consciousness, awareness ahead of pleasing them. As simple as that. Find your own examples of it. Don't go along with that dirty joke. I'm telling you, you are forbidden to ever again go along with a dirty joke that that man or woman gives you. I forbid it, absolutely. You're not to smile, you're not to laugh, you're to refuse it by the expression on your face, if by nothing else. That is loving truth more than the pleasure of the company of that man or woman. And if he wants to tell his dirty jokes, you let him tell him to tell them to some other woman, not to you. I've told you before, and I'll repeat, whether you know it or not, and few people really know it, there is such a thing as crudeness and vulgarity and bad manners. And don't you put up with it from that person. And in that way, you'll begin to love your eternity more than time, more than the temporary benefits of having him or her around. And ladies have the courage this is not a moral teaching on the everyday level. It's a moral teaching a thousand miles high. You tell that man in your life, you never want to hear him use a vulgar, crude word again. And he'll think you're trying to be religious or something, but you know better. Don't you use that language around me. I don't want to hear it anymore. And of course, he will hate you whether suppressed or not, because you have exposed his bad manners, which means he's asleep. Have the courage to do that. If you can't start anywhere else, start with that. And don't you ever tell dirty stories, by the way. There is such a thing as purity. Purity being of truth. That's what we're seeking. So let's start in small, small ways at first to toss out the junk of crudeness. You show me someone who's crude and vulgar, and I'll show you an animal who hates God, who hates everything decent. Go ahead, Joe. If you are not ashamed of your weak and fearful behavior toward the opposite sex, you should be. If you are not ashamed of your weak and fearful behavior toward the opposite sex, you should be. Now, you're not really clear in your mind as to the depths of your weakness, bad behavior, fear, fawning, toward the opposite sex. I'm telling each one of you in this room and those of you listening to this tape, you are not aware of how you're pleasing them in order to keep them in your life to get what you want from them, companionship or whatever. Read it once more. If you are not ashamed of your weak and fearful behavior toward the opposite sex, you should be. 
I'm using the word ashamed deliberately this time, you understand. I'm using it deliberately in common language. You will be making small but definite progress in your life when you see quite clearly how you behave toward the other person smiling at them, for example, because you want them to like you, to keep coming around. And the first time you see this, you, you will be ashamed of yourself because you're detecting weakness. You're detecting the fact that you can't do without that other person. So practice, practice doing without him or her, mentally, mentally and physically, and watch what happens. What happens is you'll see that you needed truth more than you needed his or her company. Then when you talk with him or her, out on the lawn, or out at work, or wherever, then when you talk with him or her, what a complete relaxation you will have. Your effort, your effortless conversation will just go right along. Your mind will work properly of the things to say because you're not desperately trying to keep yourself in place, your assumed self in place, by saying the right things which are acceptable to him or her, which he or she will like. I told you men at the beginning of this series, and I'll repeat it, you should be ashamed of your weakness and your cowardly behavior toward women. You're not a man at all when you do that. And the woman knows it too, don't you ladies? Mm -hmm. You know it, you know what he's getting at. And you had better be strong too. When you see that man's weakness, don't, don't you scorn it. You would go wrong if you scorn his weakness or take advantage of it. You're just as evil as he is. You'll be strong through seeing the whole process, see what is going on. And don't, don't take part in his weakness, but be strong yourself. And he has to be strong for himself. Go ahead, Joe. A, bro <clears throat> a broken romance brings a broken heart only if you enjoy it. A broken romance brings a broken heart only if you enjoy it. Is that the last one? Mm hmm Yeah. A broken romance brings a broken heart only if you enjoy it. How many of you have enjoyed a broken heart? Let's see the hands of our heartbroken lovers out here. Wasn't that a wonderful, dramatic moment for you, why it went on? Huh? How you cried and hoped that he cried too. You wondered whether you should phone. And when the phone rang, you wondered whether it was him and what was your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, when you walk toward that telephone, don't you imagine who's on it. Let it be whoever it may be, even a salesman selling you the aluminum sidings for your house, <laughs> and you treat him properly. If you don't want aluminum siding, say thank you and hang up. That doesn't have to go into very much, does it? All right, we're going to have open discussion now. I'm all through. I'm all through talking about sex directly. Now we'll have it in future talks in other ways because everything is connected. Finally, what's right sexually? Now look, you be very careful don't you dare twist what I'm going to say. You're entitled to your individual sex life according to your type, according to what is right for you, right for your conditions. And it may vary among people. Obviously it does. But there's no such thing as you having wrong sex and it being right for someone else. 
You understand what I'm trying to say? Don't just, I'm trying to get you to not distort what I'm saying. If sex is wrong, it's wrong. You may go without sex, if you wish. Someone else may have sex frequently. That's right for him. If you're both conscious and awake, where's the problem? See? But you find out for yourself what is right for you, and don't you lie about it just because you enjoy it. Okay, we can talk if we like. Before you do, however, will you all please do what I just did? Do it consciously, do it deliberately. We all take a deep sigh and relax. Did it cause you any pain? Oh, you were already relaxed? <coughs> Don't you kid me. You're not relaxed at all. Let's just let the thing, let's just let the whole thing fall apart right now, huh? Let's let it fall apart. I don't care what happens next. I want what happens next of itself not prompted by me or by you. When that comes first, anything can happen and it's okay. Understand? That's the absence of compulsion. And the bearing of the dreadful emptiness and silence that we always want to fill with the sound of our voice or the noise of our neurosis. Get so relaxed that if you relax any more, you'll fall off the chair. This is the unknown, therefore it's uncomfortable. To one degree or another, to one degree or another, you are all right now in a state of discomfort. Stay that way. All right, would you like to ask questions or make comments on the topic of sex and male-female relations? I don't believe that we have directly discussed the question of sexual repression, specifically Suppose that one meets an authority who claims to be purveying the authentic moral teaching on the subject of sex, which clashes with one's own understanding. How does one resolve this conflict? Do you remember what I said at the beginning of this series and just repeated briefly a short time ago? All right, all right. Let's take five topics. I'll number them off on my fingers. Sex, God, death, money, old age. Five times, right? Mm -hmm. How would you like to know everything possible to know about those five subjects? So that they're perfectly clear to you. All five different topics, right? Who knows the answers, or rather, who understands old age, death, 
sex, the rest of it. Who understands? Truth? Truth? M maybe we don't. Are you going to listen to what Sally says about sex? Are you going to listen to what Jim says about old age? What Leland says about money? What if Dorothy says a different thing than Sally does? What if George says a different thing than Leland says? Who are you going to... This gets awful confusing trying to find someone who knows the answers because you, in your mind, here's five teachers. Christ, etc., Buddha, etc. All these people know the truth and they all say different things about sex. So you're going to believe the one you want to believe? That's dishonest, isn't it? Why don't you give up taking anybody's word for anything and find out for yourself? Because you're too lazy. Because you want the answer that pleases your conditioning. Why don't you get the answer straight from the original source, which is available? Which is available! You want your answer or do you want the answer? See? We don't want the answer. I might have to give something up. And by the way, suppose you hear someone who says, you must give up sex to find God. <clears throat> Is that going to give you a problem? Yeah. You're going to stop reading that man's books, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you take his word for that? Why don't you find out for yourself? Not because you want to continue with sex. You want sex and God both. Why don't you find out for yourself what the answer is? See, you're afraid when you put down a book or even pick up a book. Why don't you find out for yourself? Why don't you get all your preferences out of the way? Ah, because we don't want to get our preferences out of the way, do we? We don't even know that we have preferences. And we'll call our preferences enlightenment from God himself. And there's a 50 theological books that will back me up. Toss them out. Boy, I'll tell you. Why don't you find out from God? So you hear ten different teachers who tell you ten different things? All right, examine that knowledge. Examine it. Maybe, just maybe, one of those teachers will appeal to something that is not your conditioning, not your preference, and will ring a bell that you sense is right that is not a part of thought. Follow this. Follow this. See? And then you have to use reason, common sense. Then maybe read this man's books a little more and get a little few more ideas without falling into the idea that everything he says is pure gospel. He may be mixed up. That's right. The greatest teacher you ever read may be mixed up in some areas. Do you have the courage to destroy your idol in order to find something that is higher than the human personality? Maybe that teacher himself is trying to prove something. Maybe there's something wrong with him. Dare to find out. Why are you smiling, Leland? <laughs> He blushes too. He blushes too. Yeah, he does. He gets red. <laughs> In connection with um, any of us, I'll repeat a remark that I made at Joan's house, which I'm sure you'll agree with. If we had to wait until we had the perfect student, <laughs> we, <laughs> we wouldn't have a class at all, would we? This includes all of us. Yes. Sure. Where are your mixed up parts? What do you think? <laughs> I can't find them yet. <laughs> You're looking? <laughs> You're looking? You're, you seem very authentic. But. <laughs> no, I didn't say but. Oh. <laughs> 
all right, you had better do the same thing with me. I know you're watching me carefully. I know that. Watch me. You can catch me if you... If you can catch me in an error based on your authentic understanding, fine. Don't let your conditioning judge me, though, or you'll find what you want to find instead of what is yes. truth. Yes? It is the area in which we have problems that we will try to fight, fight and make you appear wrong. That's good. Leland thought about that for a minute. <laughs> Don't mutter. I said so did I. Yes. In a state of consciousness, would the terms active and passive be necessary? Not really. Let's, for now, leave those to a lower level. It can be part of the whole, certainly, active and passive. Otherwise, you'll get confused. Can we explore that just a little bit? That is the idea of active and passive. Uh, <clears throat> if we start... <clears throat> I, I uh, want to say this as consciously as possible. Uh, during the course of the talks, you mentioned that uh, in any reasonably functioning family, the male will take the lead, that is, be the active part, as we all understand naturally. However, suppose we approach it idealistically, and the father turns out to be a drunk, and a complete... he just can't face life at all. So? So the obvious answer is, if the mother has anything going for her, she picks up the reins and carries on. Oh yes, but if she she is working on herself, she could do that properly. She could be active consciously, say, not from her conditioning, where she resents taking the active part, say. It's all very subtle. really what your answer to the question was saying is that if the question is approached on the level of thought, that is, with ideas ahead of time of what is proper, then the result cannot be proper. Okay. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, I want to say about thinking for ourselves, I can see that my life has been a habit, pattern, of following the path of least resistance and thinking, being too lazy to sort things out in my mind for myself, and therefore following any idea that's handed to me because it's easier to follow a wrong idea than it is to stir my brains up, so to speak, and really think for myself and find out what is the Quite way. right. Quite right. Which is why it is absolutely necessary for you to be shocked and insulted in order to grow. You will not listen to anything but shocks and insults. And even they are taken 99 out of 100 times wrongly with resistance and resentment. I know 100% clear to me the only chance any one of you in this room has of breaking out of yourself is to be shocked and insulted in 50 different ways, a hundred different ways, as many ways as I can find. Telling you to get out of here might be one of them, so that you're forced to make your choice which you want, the truth here or your own vanity. You have no chance, because as Alan said, we're too lazy. Nothing will force you to look at yourself except shocks. And each one of you have to be given them in slightly different, well, largely different ways, depending upon you. Because I can tell where you need to be shocked. And I also know where it would be too much for you to be shocked. You wouldn't be able to take it. New people who come here, have you ever noticed how harshly they're treated? 
You idiot, either you want this or you don't. I don't have time to waste on you. And when they go out of here, they make their decision. And not, what, 99 out of 100 don't come back? That one who's been insulted knows the rightness of that insult and will come back for more. The other 99, I have no time to let five or six sleeping people who will often even sit together unconsciously because they're on the same level, sit together and one of them will make a hostile remark and the other will, that's right, that's right. I have no time for that stupidity. Nobody is going to lower the level of this class. You get blasted the minute you come in here and if you don't want it, goodbye. We have things to do with our life, which is to wake up. If you pass the first small tests, you can then be given some major ones. <laughs> the gentleman brought up during the break the question of denial. Have you ever noticed that when you deny yourself something, there's a good deal of pain and good deal of conflict? Can anything that leads to pain and conflict be right? Can suppression, suppression ever be right? I have a, a, a compulsive, uh, lustful sex thought toward a woman, for example. And I've been told by the church that that's evil and I'll go to hell if I think lustful sex thought. So I suppress the thought. Have I done anything but suppress it? Have I got rid of it, for example? All I've done is push it out of my consciousness because I feel guilty about it. Nothing good has happened. So there's something wrong with denial. Because denial is always on the same level. The two things are always on the same level. My denial and what I have denied. They're both on the level of thinking. Can't we do something far more intelligent with a problem, a sex thought problem, or whatever it might be, a jealous problem, a worried about financial problem? Can't we do something far more intelligent with it, simply to see it go through our minds and see that we've made a false connection? We've made a false connection with what I have called me. In reality, on a higher level of understanding, you're not lustful at all. You've been taken over by a lustful thought, but you've identified with that, and so you deny it. So denial prevents comprehension. Consciousness, awareness, bringing it up from the dark room up to where we can see it is the beginning of the ending of it, because then we can no longer identify with it and therefore no longer suffer from it. Look, how can I put it? Try to see completely how evil you are, how wicked you are, how terrible you are, what a liar you are, what a hypocrite you are, what a sneaky little schemer you are. See that so that you can go beyond it. Denial of that will keep it in place. This means the destruction of images, doesn't it? I don't think lustful thoughts. I'm pure. What a liar. And you're afraid God is going to punish you. You're already being punished by your own darkness. Never mind future punishment. Punishment is right now as is right reward right now. Get time out of it. All right, what would you like to talk about? We have a nice long time. When you said denial, I didn't, I didn't connect it with suppression. It was more like if I had an urge to smoke a cigarette and wouldn't give in to an urge and observe it. Well, if, you're, if you refuse to take the cigarette in order to create conscious conflict in you, then that's another matter. Yeah. Then you become, can become aware of it. In connection with that, the cigarette or whatever, let me repeat a, a right technique. Now let's see if you remember it and do it, or are you going to walk out and forget it? Most of the time we walk out and forget it, right? Let's go right back to the slow down, one thing at a time technique. All day long, you should be spending where you can, not at work necessarily. You should be spending your day, you're at home alone, what are you doing? You're patching up your dress. you got a rip in it. 
I'm reaching for the needle. Go, just, I'm reaching for the needle. I'm It'll drive you nuts. I told you that. <laughs> because you want to go fast. Get the death plan. Go on to the next thing. Dare to be without the next thing. Write that down, Leila. Dare to be without the next thing. You're reaching for the, uh, what do you sew with? A needle? You pick it up. You take the thread. Let's see, blue or red. Well, the dress is red. I'll use red. And you pick up and you put it through. In time, you'll be able to do that at a faster speed, but you have to slow down in order to see your hand moving on, getting up. This breaks unconsciousness, mechanical habit, and makes you conscious. As simple and as great as that. Where can you slow down? For example, when you were watering Leland, you could have slowed down just for maybe five seconds would have been enough. And then 10 minutes later, another five seconds. Do it for, if you can only do it for five seconds, that's great. You can do that at work all the time. And then go back to the usual speed. Watch and see what it does for you. Watch and see how it frees you of the tyrants, tyrants of your own mind. Fred. Could you also stop yourself and see where you're at? That Pardon? Could you also stop yourself and see where you're at? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Walking, you mean? Well, if you're working, let's say, and then stop all of a sudden. Oh, sure. You. That'll give you a shock, won't it? You're not used to it, and that's what we're after. Stop right in the middle of that room as you're crossing it. Stop and be aware of where you are. Even your body will object. I used to notice this when I used to practice this and still do. For example, I'd be walking out somewhere. Sometimes I walk to town and back. And one time I noticed that uh, I was going from town back to home and I came to the truck road over there where all the trucks go down and cars go down the lake. And I was walking at a certain rapid pace. At that particular moment, I was going faster than usual. And as I get up to truck road, my body was moving fast, going right along there, you know. But the trucks came, so I couldn't continue with it. And so I noticed that my body said, don't slow down, Never, those trucks shouldn't be there. Don't, keep going the way you want, you're always going, see. So I noticed my body objecting to me slowing down. But I saw that. So I deliberately, I had to slow down or get knocked off the road anyway. <laughs> So I deliberately slowed down, but the main thing, I notice how even the physical body objects to a change of pace. We're deliberately inducing a change of pace in order to make us awake for just a few seconds, maybe. Then I, when I got across the road, I started going fast again. I mean, accidents do happen on account the body does not want to stop. Accidents do happen. Yes, because very the body, good. The body sometimes does not want to react fast enough to a dangerous situation until the mind says uh -huh. jump. How about quarrels with people because your emotions don't want to stop? Yeah. So you keep the fight going, right? Because yeah. it's so wonderfully comfortable to have somewhere to go, even if it's into a bump, bopped beak. <laughs> <laughs> that always gets Sally, so I said it. <laughs> I think when you said uh, get whatever we can from you because before you die. Why did you hesitate? Because uh, you're putting me on a spot with your shocks on my stupid questions. So I was going to ask you a good question. You're emotional now, aren't you? A little bit. All right, just simply be aware of that. Now go. <clears throat> What's your concept of death? What happens after death? Who wants to know? Uh, it. <laughs> May I volunteer the perfect answer? Yes. <laughs> Die and find out. <laughs> I didn't like Leland's uh, two weeks ago, his presentation, but he has given me a lot of good shocks and uh, just in little cards he's presented to me think for yourself and it puts me in conflict with you though okay uh, yes please we are so touchy about sex pardon the pun 
Um, it seems, it shows how little we connected in the proper perspective. Oh yeah, yeah. It's and, really blown out of proportion. Well, and we're hiding things from ourselves regarding it. Not that you tell people about your sex life, and you shouldn't. Go ahead, Leland. I was just going to say, the notion of dying is not physically dying, but dying while we're still alive. I'm sure that when we're able to do that, we'll certainly know what death is all about. This what is what we're, we're talking about, dying while we're still alive. And I told you earlier in the talk today, eternity is the absence of ordinary thought. I didn't say Dorothy's eternity, or Vernon's eternity, or George's eternity. I said eternity. Dorothy has no eternity. Vernon has no eternity. George has no eternity. Something that is not my identity has eternity. That's, you, you want to live as you... You want to take you to heaven? <laughs> Would it be heaven? <laughs> Whatever you are right now is obviously your heaven or your hell, isn't it? Right now. Right at 10 o'clock. It seems to me that the larger a group or a, a church congregation or whatever, the larger it is, the more pleasing it is to man's ego. Well said. Well said. Truth can never be part of a mass movement. Never, never, never. The masses who even followed Christ or Buddha the masses who followed them did not want the truth. They wanted the loaves and fishes. Mm 